Hi, Martin Turner here. This week we have our first of two lectures on predicting the future. We move from understanding the past to shifting our focus to the future. We shift our focus to the future and look at sales growth and how not all sales growth is good. And we consider the economic and business drivers of our firm's accounting drivers by looking at Ryman Healthcare. We then focus on the key issue of how we can connect our firm's accounting drivers with their economic and business drivers. First, let's look at the key accounting drivers. Hi, Martin Turner here, and welcome to our week seven lecture for Act 13017, Predicting the Future. We now move from understanding the past and coming to grips with where our firm has been and what it's doing to now turning our mind to the future. And in business, business is all about um, making decisions in relation to the future. Businesses are moving forward and, um, and it, that's the key area of interest. And in terms of our context here of looking at analysing firms and valuing it, it this is now the uh, key part. Our agenda today, well, we're going to review week six and, uh, and then we'll have a look. We're going to focus in on the accounting drivers. These are the key accounting drivers uh, that drive economic profit and free cash flow in our firms. And so our economic profit model and discounted cash flow models help us to focus on these key accounting drivers. We're still in the numbers, we're still in the accounting, and then these key accounting drivers then help us focus on or ask the question, what's causing them in the business? The accounting numbers aren't the business, the business is the business, what's causing them? And that's the economic and business drivers. And we're going to have a look today and we're going to see that we, we can't just forecast the accounting drivers and the financial statements. We have to go and connect into the real world, to the economic and business drivers of our firm, because that is what we're going to be forecasting. That's the key thing. And we'll be looking at that and then we'll have a minute paper. Understanding the past last last uh, week, we completed our analysis of return on equity, and that was efficiency and leverage revisited. In the previous week, we'd looked at um, leverage and profitability, and the third aspect of efficiency. And this is the accounting drivers, the drivers of our financial statements. And we're looking at return on equity because we're also including leverage, that's the financial leverage. I flagged that we'll be focusing very soon on return on net operating assets and on operating uh, and, and on abnormal operating income as we're focusing on the enterprise value, on the operations of our firm. And we'll be doing that. We'll be moving towards that now. But we, we looked at and analysed the return on equity so that we could also see leverage, the financial leverage. And, um, and we, we went through leverage again and broke, and we can see how there's operating and financial leverage and various ways that we can look at it um, as we break that up. So now we're turning our minds to the future and uh, to the key accounting drivers. There's a great video on key accounting drivers these, these links are live on the lecture slides uh, for this week. They're also in the, um, in the video section, um, in the orientation um, tile. And so in the videos in weeks four to six, the key accounting drivers, there's a great video in there. And these are our, our, our framework, the way of thinking of how firms add value is the economic profit framework and the cash flow, discounted cash flow framework. So we're looking at the key accounting drivers that are driving economic profit and cash flow in our business. 
And these short videos like one on key accounting drivers are a key part of our unit and you should be looking at those each week and, um, and they supplement a lot of the lecture as well. So these are the key accounting drivers that we have uh, that support economic profit and free cash flow in our businesses. Return on net operating assets. You see how we're now focusing on return on net operating assets, not return on equity, as we're not focusing on the financial leverage. Now the operating activities, return on net operating assets and the two accounting drivers of return on net operating assets are profit margin and asset turnover. Return on net operating assets equals profit margin times asset turnover. And also sales and particularly sales growth. Um, sales growth, there's a great video on sales growth and also on good and bad sales growth. These are two very important short videos that, again, the links are live on the slides for the week seven tile. And uh, a lot of people can think that sales growth is good. All sales growth is good, but uh, not all sales growth is good. And we need to be able to discern between good and bad sales growth. And we'll be looking at that a bit, not this week, but we will be looking at that a bit. And uh, there's some great videos on that. You need to get a really good grip on sales growth and particularly be able to discern the difference between good and bad sales growth. Some sales growth will add value to your firm and some won't. So we've got sales and sales growth and net operating assets. These are our key accounting drivers that will add, add value, that uh, are driving our economic profit and um, cash flow in our business. So these are the key uh, parts of the um, accounts that we're looking at. Now, these are the accounting drivers that are driving our financial statements, that are driving our economic profit, our free cash flow. But it's all just the numbers still. These are just um, passengers going on the journey. And, uh, but they help us to focus our mind on what's driving them. Raman Healthcare has a very high profit margin, low asset turnover. It's got strong sales growth, strong consistent sales growth and strongly growing net operating assets. What's causing that to happen in Raman Healthcare? What's driving those accounting drivers? What economic and business realities are driving the accounting drivers? Some people find themselves just naturally asking those questions and they just start to think about it and come up with ideas particularly if you've spent the time to understand what your firm does and to understand its uh, strategy and its market, what markets it's in and so forth, what, what it's actually doing. If you've got a bit of a grip on that and you didn't, didn't skim over that too much, then that you've got something to work with as you think about why, what is causing the accounting drivers to be the way they are. So some people just find themselves asking their questions and they've already been doing that and they're starting to think about um, possible reasons. Other people, can, you, you might feel like there's a barrier. You know, you're used, you might have felt that you were sort of used to sticking to the numbers. <laughs> you might have thought that accounting was about the numbers. And uh, that's a trap when studying accounting is that we get so wrapped up in the numbers. It's important to get on top of the numbers, but there's more to it. It's the business. That's what we're interested in. And accounting is all about connecting to the business and to the key aspects of the business that are driving value. And so you're getting some experience of doing that. If you're finding you're getting a bit of a barrier to it, um, make sure you're talking to other people in the unit. Throw out some ideas um, of what you think might be driving it and, and ask around, ask other people. You, know, you can explain what your firm does and you might be wondering why it has such a low profit margin or why its sales growth is suddenly been kicking up recently or whatever it is, um, and see what other people think. Other people might have some thoughts. And um, there's certainly some great, uh, quite a few people have got the idea that the best way to learn is to help other people and discuss questions with other firms as well. And key aspects of what we're interested with our firms in terms of the accounting drivers, expected future sales growth. 
So we can see the sales and how they've been growing in the past, but what do we think is going to happen in the future? What sort of sales growth do we think our firm is going to be having? And we're going to be forecasting over five years. So what sort of sales growth do we think is going to happen there? And so for Ryman Healthcare, what, 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 uh, what uh, do I think on that? And it's this future sales growth and also the net operating assets that we expect will be needed to support that sales growth, which is the uh, inverse of the asset turnover. What, um, so there are two as key aspects that we'll be forecasting for our firm, sales growth and net operating assets that's needed to support that growth. So how do we get to these future accounting drivers? How do we get to our expected uh, future sales growth? How do we get to our expected net operating assets in the future years uh, and asset turnover? How do we do this? Well, it would be great if we could just start have a look at what they were in the past. What was the sales growth in the past? What was the net operating assets in the past and so forth? And then just sort of say, oh, I think they'll be the same or I, I think they'll change. And just... Or, and, and just sort of move across. Um, we often have a tendency to think the future is going to be a continuation of the past. <laughs> we, have a, we have a psychological bias often to that. And, uh, but, you know, that's often not the case for a lot of businesses particularly. And uh, so what we have to do, we can't just do that. What we've got to do is we've got to move from the accounting drivers of the past profit margin, asset turnover, return on net operating assets, sales and sales growth, net operating assets, and ask ourselves what's been causing them in the past. And then we need to forecast those economic and business realities. They're what we forecast. And then we need to connect those forecasts of economic and business realities to the accounting drivers. So that's how we get there. We can't just go straight across and stick the accounting numbers. We've got to get into the business. And that's true for accounting generally. So you're getting some experience of, of being an accountant. We've got to use the numbers to connect to the business. And, and we've got to make some predictions around that, what we think is going to happen. So we might have the return on net operating assets in the past, and Ryman Healthcare has got a whole, a whole lot of numbers there, return on net operating in the past. Its return on net operating assets used to be huge years ago and has been gradually coming down and down. But what is it going to be in the future? Well, we go, what has been causing the return on net operating assets in the past? What has been driving that for Roman Healthcare? We're going to forecast that and then we'll get to our forecast of return on net operating assets. So what's been driving the profit margins and the net operating assets of Roman Healthcare in the past? And uh, where well, we've got to connect to reality. A key driver of Roman Healthcare's profit margins, sales growth, net operating assets has been growth in residential property values. So Ryman Healthcare is, is a bit of a play on residential property values. And, um, and particularly it's driven by the residential property values within the 10 kilometer radius of its various retirement villages, both in New Zealand and in Melbourne. In the last 12 months, residential property values went up 20% in New Zealand. But in the past, they've had a lot of growth in various times, the same in, in, in Victoria. So that's been one of the key drivers. And the reason it's a driver of profit margins, net operating assets, sales growth and so forth, is that, if house, is that people sell their houses to go and buy occupancy rights in a retirement village. So the more they get for their house, the more they can afford to pay for a occupancy rights in the retirement village unit. And also a driver of value to, in um, Roman Healthcare too, in terms of the valuation of, they don't sell the retirement villages 
in the units, they keep them. They sort of like lease them out for life and they revalue their property, their, their um, retirement village units and, uh, and villages regularly. And, what's, and, in, and a key part in those valuations are residential house prices. If they go up, then the, uh, they will, um, the valuations of their property will go up. Another economic and business reality for Ryman Healthcare is strong demand for retirement village units. This has been the case for a long time now. There's been strong demand. And uh, they've been, they went through the, um, you know, the global financial crisis, for example, and various recessions, and they never missed a beat. That demand was still there because it was need-based. People needed, at, you know, it's, at certain ages, they needed to make that sort of move. And so there's been a strong demand for retirement village units. It's been driven in part by the fact that the baby boomers are starting to get a bit older and there's some growth, 2 or 3% a year growth in the number of people in that sort of late 70s plus age group. And uh, But a much bigger, well, that's 2 or 3%. That's not huge growth. But that's something. But the other main part of it is the proportion of people, the proportion of people who are, say, 75 plus who want to live in retirement villages is been steadily increasing. And it's that report, that is what's been causing the, the, growth, the demand for these retirement village units to keep growing. That's been quite a consistent trend and, um, and uh, that's been... So I'm expecting reduced levels of expected future growth in residential property values. Uh, 2022, 15%, 2023, 10%, 2024, 0%, 2025, 2.5%, 2.5%, 2.5%, 2.5%, 2.5%, 2.5%, 2.5%, 2.5%, 2.5%, 2.5%, 2.5%, 2.5%, 2.5%, 2.5%, 2.5%, 2.5%, 
So I'm looking at return on net operating assets being pretty constant through this five-year period with a slight dip in 2024. And to forecast my net operating assets, I'm going to forecast sales and asset turnover because net operating assets equals sales divided by asset turnover. And so sales, 2022, I'm forecasting 872 million, 2023, 965, 2024, 1 billion and 67 million dollars, 2025, 1.193 billion, and 2026, 1.332 billion. So I'm forecasting continued strong growth in sales for Ryman Healthcare. And uh, they've got the uh, developments in train in the pipeline to support those sorts of sales. And the asset turnover, well, we've, the same as before, 0.19 in 2022 and then 0.20 from 2023 to 2026. As net operating assets equals sales divided by asset turnover, that gives me net my forecast of net operating assets of four billion five hundred eighty nine point five million dollars in 2022, 2023 four billion eight hundred twenty five point oh million dollars, 2024 five billion and three hundred thirty five point oh million dollars, 2025 five point nine six five billion dollars, and in 2026 six point six six billion dollars. So I'm forecasting some continued strong growth in net operating assets over the next five years. So now that I've got my return on net operating assets and net operating asset forecast for the next five years, I can forecast economic profit. And by economic profit equals return on net operating assets minus the weighted average cost of capital minus one, all times net operating assets keeping weighted average cost of capital constant at 8%. So we can calculate the economic profit, 2022, $206.5 million. 2023, $212.3 million. 2024, $213.4 million. 2025, $262.5 million. 2026, $293.0 million. So I'm forecasting economic profit to grow slightly, just slightly in the next um, three years, and then to go kick up quite a lot in 2025 and 2026. As a result of some increase, some small increases in return on net operating assets and quite significant increases in net operating assets. So in other words, I'm forecasting Ryman Healthcare to be able to continue to strongly grow its sales and net operating assets while keeping its return on net operating assets um, pretty uh, stable. So what do we have to do with our firms? Well, we've got to identify the key accounting drivers. And that's what we've looked at here. We've looked at return on net operating assets, which equals profit margin times asset turnover. We've looked at sales and sales growth, and we've looked at net operating assets. They're our key accounting drivers of economic profit and, dis and um, free cash flow. We've then asked ourselves, well, what drives these accounting drivers to be at the levels they are? Primary healthcare, high profit margins, low asset turnovers, and so forth. Strongly growing sales, growing its net operating assets, what's driving that? And so I've shown you the sorts of economic and business realities that I focused on as driving these uh, key accounting drivers. So that's what you've got to do for your firm. And uh, discussing with other people will be an important part of really getting a bit of depth to some of those, that part of the analysis. And remember that a key part, this is for accounting generally, but a key part for financial statement analysis is that we need to focus on the drivers of the financial statements, and but we need to move to the drivers of economic and business realities. And we need to understand the connections between the drivers of the financial statements, which is return net operating assets, profit margin, asset turnover, sales growth, net operating assets. Those drivers of the financial, we need to understand the connection with the drivers of the economic and business realities. That's what makes a quality analysis. 
And that's what people are looking for from an account, say you're a management accounting, they're looking for, for you to provide information on that indicates critical parts of the business and, and, and whether things are on track or not, or what's going on. So what are the key accounting drivers of your firm? Emily, what are the key accounting drivers of your firm? What do you think? Or what are they? Yeah. Pardon? Uh, what are the key accounting drivers of your firm? What is your firm? Uh, so my firm is Globe International. So it's a um, footwear and apparel manufacturing company, um, as Globe. well as a um, hard goods manufacturing. So they manufacture like skateboards, um, electric skateboards, surfboards, snowboards, and um, roller skates. Yeah, so Globe has sort of had action fashion wear and then they're getting into this sort of action sort of, are they making things? Do they actually yeah. make these things? Yeah. So they've they got um, manufacturing plants. There's one in China. There's, uh, I think there's four. Off the top of my head, I can't remember the exact locations of them all, but, yeah, they do use a lot of timber in their manufacturing. Um, and, yeah. So uh, they've got manufacturing facilities in China. Do they own those manufacturing facilities? Uh, they lease. Lease? Uh, so they do have some lease. Uh, I think they own them in China, but then they lease um, other buildings around the world where they have their manufacturing plants. Yeah, that's all right. I was meaning it doesn't matter whether they lease the buildings or not. I was just thinking, do they, they don't have other businesses making them for them. Oh, no, no, sorry. So they are manufacturing business, not just a brand yeah. business. No. All right. So, and they're doing it in a number of countries. You need to be clearer on some of these things if you're going to be starting to forecast economic and business reality. So you're going to have to come back, just tighten up a little bit about what your firm does and particularly the relative, how big the different bits are relative to each other. Okay. Like if they do skateboards and it's a tiny little bit of their business, well, then it probably doesn't matter what you think about that. Yeah. But if it's, you know, um, so having said that, what are the key accounting drivers of your firm? Um, that's a really, I would say their um, asset turnover. Asset turnover. So does it have a high or low asset turnover? It's fairly low. Oh, what is it? Um, I'm going to pull my spreadsheet back You're up. You're pull your spreadsheet up, actually. I'll That's pull right. my spreadsheet up so I can give you proper answers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need to do that. Um, so asset turnover, while you're doing that, asset turnover is one of them. What are some of the other accounting drivers? Um, profit margin. Profit margin, yeah. So profit margin times asset turnover gives you your return on net operating assets. Yeah. And what else? Uh, return on equity, but I don't think that's. No, no, we're be not going to focus on return on equity now. We're going to ret focus on return on net operating assets. Okay. Yeah, because we've moved on. We, we looked at that at first because we want to look at leverage. Now we're just looking at the operations. And uh, what about sales and sales growth? Yes. And net operating assets, level of net operating assets. They're your yeah. key accounting drivers. They're the same yeah. for everybody, aren't they? Yes. Yeah. we're using the same model. So what's your asset turnover lot like in the past? Have you got your spreadsheet up? I've got my spreadsheet up. Um, so my asset turnover is a, no, just over three. Well, three is high. Average is three. about two. Roman Healthcare's is only 0.15. You got three. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So it sits just over three percent on most. No, years. three times. Three times. Three times. Yeah. Asset yeah. turnover. You're talking Ugh. times. Times. Yes. Yeah. Three times. So we usually do it to two decimal places. So yours. Say it was three. Exactly. It would be three point oh oh. Okay. So I've um, got. Is that what um, we're talking about? Is that what we're talking about? About three times. Yeah, so it has dropped slightly. Um, so it was 3.95 in um, 2017 and then 2020 
it's 3.39. And what was it before that? Uh, oh, so you, you went through the, uh, oh, you're 17. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sorry. So over those few years, it's declined quite a bit. Yes. So what's caused that? Oh, well, we'll wait, wait a second. Well, well, uh, let's just park that for the moment. What about okay. profit margin? What's happened to that? Um, profit margin has kind of gone a little bit funny. Um, so 2017, it was 3.4%. Uh, then it's jumped up to 6.7, then jumped down to three point uh, to 5.3. And then in 2020, um, it's dropped down to 3.9. Yeah, so it's sort of been up and down a bit. In a yeah. And, and reasonably low profit margins. Yeah. And high asset turnover. And what about your... Um, and so what, what happened to your return on net operating assets during that period? Um, it, it did much the same. So it was 15, then dropped, uh, then went up to 21, dropped down to 18, and now it's sitting at 14.9. Uh, uh, so it's sort of been up and down a little bit, yeah. A little bit, yeah. It's yeah. sort of followed a similar trend to the net profit margin. Yeah, to your profit margin. Yeah. It's been driving that largely. Your net operating, but your asset turnover has been declining a little bit. So that's also just contributed to it coming down a little bit. Um, and what about sales and sales growth or sales and sales uh, growth? Yeah. So my sales have grown um, over time. So. Uh, So they were, um, in 2017, they were 140. Percent. Thousand, oh, sorry, I was doing oh, sorry, oh, you're doing sales. Oh, yeah. Do you have yeah. sales growth there on your spreadsheet? Why don't we look at that, actually? Sorry. Uh, uh, oh, we'll do sales if you've got it there. So your sales were 140 million, were they, in 2017? Oh, sorry. Yep, yeah, I've got growth in sales. Yep. Yeah. Um, so 93, then 105, 107, and then 95. Yeah, so your sales have been pretty flat. What, what, what yeah. they were 90 something, what were they 140 and 17? What were they in 2000? Uh, in 2020, yeah, uh, in 2020, they were 151. Yeah, so you've sort of gone from 140 to 151. And it's probably, it looks like it's bounced around a little bit in between. A little bit, yeah. Yeah, so you can see your sales growth, you sort of had a little bit of negative, you've had a little bit of sales growth, you know. You, you've expressed it as 93 and 105 and that sort of stuff. So 105 is like a 5% sales percent. growth. Yeah. yeah. And okay. you've had a little bit up and down, haven't you? But a not little bit. Stellar, yeah. Not stellar sales growth. No. And, uh, and what about net operating assets? What's been happening there? Um, they, oh, let me just go back up. Um, so my net operating assets have grown. Um, so they've gone from 35 um, in 2017 to 44 in 2020. 35 what? Million or billion? Uh, 35 million. 35 million. Yeah. Not a lot, is it? No. So what What make it? So you haven't got a lot of net operating assets. No. And But they have grown a bit. A little bit, yes. Yeah. And you can see your sales growth or sales bouncing around. You might have some information on which bits of the business it's been growing because it seems like it's so been... Thing. Yeah, so 2020, um, they had significant growth in the roller skating um, arm of the business because um, they found a research in like the roller skating sport. Um, and they also found that over COVID, a lot of people sort of started buying roller skates for some strange reason. Or just generally um, bikes and all sorts of things. Yeah, yeah. so roller skates as well. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, but then they, they've also noticed that there's been a resurgence in the roller skating sport. So like your roller derby and all that kind of thing has started to take off again, but that is a fluctuating market. And so what you've got to do is you've got to look at this, but you've got to look at the big items. Like okay. roller skating might be some tiny part of their sales or it might be, but it might be growing very strongly and so be a big part of your sales growth or, or not. Yep. I don't know. And sometimes they, the write-ups in the companies sort of can emphasise things they just want you to focus Think. on, you know. Yeah. But, um, but that's good. So, so that's what's happened in the past. So the question is, what's been driving, like your, um, your, uh, we looked at your asset turnover and your profit margin and, and those things, is, and you've got a bit of a sense of what's been causing it. But, so they're the key accounting drivers. Well, that's probably enough at this point. And, um, and you can see what they are there. Return on net operating yeah. assets, profit margin, asset turnover, sales, sales growth, net operating assets. So you've, you've been looking at those. You can look at these little videos on sales growth and good and bad sales growth will really help you get to grips on that. Okay. And um, the... Uh, a lot of people who, who are in marketing think all sales growth is good. Often they can often sort of assume that, but that's not the case, you know. I, I'm a marketing student as well. You're a marketing student. <laughs> Do you think all sales growth is good? Uh, when when you said that, I actually had to think about that, and I went, "Oh, okay." I'm like, "Well, wouldn't all sales growth be good?" And then I kind of thought about it, and I went, "Well, no. If it's costing you." more to create those sales then that's not necessarily good sales growth well if you've got negative margins that wouldn't be good yes. but that's what you're saying there i think is it costs yeah. you more to make it than you can sell them for yeah that wouldn't be good sales growth no but what if you've got a positive profit margin would that be so that's a good example that's one example but you can see there's there's a bit more to it than that what yes. about what, what if you've got a positive profit margin would that be good would that be good sales growth then potentially um see marketing people this is what they tell you you know i ran a private equity firm for many years and we want to grow the businesses and grow the sales a lot but marketing people say things like oh the customer they tell you what the customer wants have you have you looked at that a bit in marketing what yeah. the customer wants which is important but it's not everything the um well, it kind of needs to be sustainable for the business. So if you're making, you know, like, okay, you're making these sales, but how long are they, those sales going to be lasting for? Like, do you put on like a whole bunch of, I don't know, I'm probably think, overthinking this now, but if you put on a whole bunch of extra staff or something to make those sales, but it's just like a little bit of a, a blimp almost, it's not sustainable. You've just wasted not wasted, but you've invested all this extra money, but then that return's not there. You're getting there a little bit. This is, here. this, the marketing people, they tell me, oh, look, people want, they want a black one and a yellow one and a green one. They want some different colours. So we should yeah. give them the different colours rather than just give them one colour, right? So I say, okay, thanks very much for that. So say we, do, say we make them in four colours rather than one. Well, we now have to, we're going to have more inventory, aren't we? We've got to have inventory of all these four different colours instead of just one. We're, we're going to complicate our business in all sorts of ways. You know, we've got to have space for them if we've got retail space or whatever. You know, we're building in complication. We're building in more working capital. And um, so is that a good or bad thing? Depends which way you look colors, at it. Or should we just give them one? If we give them four colours, we'll, we'll sell more because there's some people who want different colours and stuff. Yeah. Or should we but, just do the one colour? But then if you have four colours and one colour really is really poorly received, then you're not going to make so much money on that. So then you've got to discount it and then you're going to lose money. That's right. So there's, but there's a lot of, you see, I don't hear marketers typically tell me, oh, you're going to have to have more working capital. You know, we might need to, you know, invest in sort of a bigger, some more machinery in the factory. And so we might have to have, you know, in other words, we have to have um, the, uh, 
the um anyway i, I want to break the i don't want to go over what's in the, those short yeah. videos but if you're in market see what we look for from people who are at senior levels in marketing it, you know in strategic marketing they understand that what we do we don't it's not about sales growth per se what it's about it's about good sales growth and what's good sales growth good sales growth is sales our sales that add value obviously you want to add value to your customers or they won't buy it but they but they also add value to our business and how do we know whether those sales are adding value to our business or not and that's often a quick you know more junior people in marketing that, that's a question they don't even ask themselves and they don't have the, any skills to answer it so what you, if you can figure out the difference between good and bad sales growth then you'll understand and so then instead of being a, a marketer who says, oh, the customers want four colours and we should give it to them. <laughs> Why should we give it to the customer? Because the customer wants it. <laughs> That's basically the sort of um, Well, wait a second. A lot of businesses have gone bust giving the customer what they want. Um, the, uh, it, you can also go bust giving them something they don't want. You've got to give them what they want, but it's got to be within the bounds of adding value to the equity investors. Yeah. So this is, if you can understand, this gives you an opportunity. You need to go through these um, videos and give this some thought. But if you can understand the difference between good and bad sales growth, you'll be miles ahead of the average marketing person. And certainly in senior levels of marketing, that's what we look for. We look for, for people telling me, ah, oh, the customer wants, the, the customer would really like these four colors, you know. <laughs> We're only doing one. They like these four colours. But, you know, if we give them all the four colours, we're going to have to, you know, make these various investments and have greater working capital. And really, the orange and the green are, are, going, are not really going to generate um, sufficient return. But the pink one that we, will be, um, we expect will be particularly... Um, popular and it'll be we'll be able to do it in this and that way that will allow us to you know, generate our return on investment return on net operating assets oh well we can have a discussion about that and then we can look through at the assumptions and and the re market research and whether we how confident we are in in um, those sort of forecasts and, and and so we've got a whole context of looking at it to add value. But if it's simply looking at what the customer wants, <laughs> it's not enough, is it? No. Um, the, uh, you know, customers want all sorts of things. And uh, the, uh, uh, so anyway, that's probably enough on that. The, um, so that's something you can, you can look at in terms of, um, uh, uh, for your firm, your firm will have some interesting issues around that. So these are the these are the key accounting drivers for all of our firms. These are what we're going to focus on because these are the key accounting drivers that are adding adding that are driving our economic profit and free cash flow. And they're going to focus our mind now. You see, your profit margin asset turnover figures were doing various things. The sales growth is going up and down. The um, your profit margin is going up and down your asset turnover was coming down a little bit over time from high levels to still pretty high levels. And um, so what's driving all that? What, what's actually happening in the business? What's causing your, what caused your profit margins to move up and then back down again, do you think? Sort of things, you know, might have. Your profit margins moved sort of, what did they go from again? Um, so it went from th uh, 3.4. Yeah. To 6.7 to 5.3 to 3.9. Yeah, so that's it. it, it so they kind of doubled. They were, but they sort of doubled almost in between. So what yeah. happened there? What, do you have any idea what was causing all that? And what's causing your profit margins to be so low anyway? So one of the things um, they had to do, and I'm not sure if this will have made that much of an impact or not, but because part of their business operates in the US. And so apparently there was, and I haven't researched it um, as much because I just hadn't thought it was 
that important, but now I'm thinking it might be. The changes in some tax rates in the US and they had to re um, revaluate something and change a few things to do with um, taxation in the US. Anyway, that's one factor you can think about. That came in pretty recently. Yeah. Tax rate changes. So, and um, the, uh, so it may not, but that could have, if the tax rate, which they, they, if the corporate tax rates in the US came down a lot, that could affect the profit margin in, in certain years, but you have to make sure it's the right years, you know, when it yes. happens. Yeah. Um, and uh, it also might make some other implications for them. So that's one potential factor, isn't it? And you've got a lot of your operations in the US or just a little bit? Uh, a lot of it is in the US. Yeah. But so it's the, there's, one, there's one thing that might have moved. It might have, but of course, your profit margin went up and then it went back down again. If the tax yeah. rates went down, that would cause your profit margins after tax to go up. But yeah. then they came back down again. So yes. it doesn't look like that was the fact, it does it. <laughs> no. Down. And they're basically still the same. But they're getting into new product ranges. Have they been doing that over the last few years? Uh, so 2017 is when they launched um, their new, so they've got a uh, like a workwear, footwear and apparel range. So yeah. they make work boots and that kind of thing. Um, and that came in in 2017. Um, and I think it was 2018 when they brought in another brand of the roller skates. Um, so those two jumps in the sales, uh, in the profit margins could be allocated to the new product. Being of course, they would have up. had to sold, have sold quite a lot of the new products to move their overall profit margins, wouldn't they? Yeah. So apparently the work where um, range has sold really quite well because it filled a like a bit of a hole in the market. Was that back in 0, 17, 0, 18, 0, 19? Uh, uh, 17 to 18. And so your profit margin is going up then. What happened to yeah. your sales in 17 and 18, your overall sales? Um, they went up slightly, but not hugely. So your sales were, were only going, they've been pretty stable, really. They've gone up yes. a little bit over that period. But your profit margins went up quite a lot there. That would have helped your um, your uh, return on net operating assets. Yes. So it's obviously, yeah, it's the net profit before tax. So something's gone on there to create that high figure. Yeah. So you can see the sort of things you can do and you're starting to sort of chip away at some of this stuff, aren't you? Yeah. And, and it's sort of, and sometimes it shows up that maybe you need to go back and look a bit more carefully at what your firm does in certain aspects or what the relative sizes of different bits would be. Bits are, yeah. And then, and, and see what you think might be causing that. And, um, and others might have some thoughts too. So you see, we come down into that as to what's been causing it in the past. You see, that's what we're talking about, isn't it? You've still yeah. got quite a lot of thinking to do about that. Yeah. But say say going into some new product ranges or workwear or whatever it was, was good for profit margins for a couple of years, but then obviously it came back down again, so something else was going on there. So you sort of get that sort of sense, but then... You can see in this graph, that's what you're doing here. You're going from the past financial statements to the past economic and business realities. And you're just starting to get a little bit of some thoughts on that. And it's these things that we're then going to have to forecast. So if, if say, uh, this this is just a simplification with what you're saying to be indicative, yeah. but say it was going into work where was really helping the margins in certain years. Well, are they, is that what's that effect going to be in the future? Are they going to go into workwear some more? Or will that workwear be something that would have run its course, you know, as being a sort of hot little area and they'll have to find another one or, you know, whatever they're going into or it's that type of thing, you know, thinking yeah. about those economic and business drives, a bit like Ryman Healthcare with its, its residential house prices. This is what happened in the past, but what's going to happen in the future? <laughs> That's where the judgments come in, isn't it? But you have yeah. to do this first bit here to get to identify these. And it's that what we forecast. And then we connect back to things like return on net operating assets, 
profit margin. Okay, That's yeah. So this is the model. I think you're getting the idea of it, aren't uh, you? Yeah, I understand that concept of, yeah, what what's this is what the financial statements currently say. So what outside of the business is driving those numbers? Yeah, it can be inside the business, what it's doing, and also the economy and economy, the markets, yeah. competitors. It's, it's a whole thing, you know. And then we sort of look into the next five years and how do we think that's going to work yeah, to then so, pull it back to the the accounting numbers. And then we push it back to accounting numbers. Yeah. And so what makes convincing forecasts? See, and when I market, I, I basically think to myself, yeah, that's pretty convincing. I think that's, I, I can see where the thinking is. Or I might think, oh, yeah, I think that's pretty good on this and that aspect, but I, I really think it's, I don't really believe this bit. That's not so convincing. They haven't really got a very good argument as to why they think that. It's it's sort of, so it's your evidence and reasons for thinking about it and okay, how you feel yep. about it. And then there are judgments to connect back to the accounting figures. So um, so you've got a bit of an example there with Ryman Healthcare in the, in the study guide. And I think you've got the concept of what to do. And you just got you. You can you can see how you need to give us a bit of time and reflect on some of these aspects. Yeah. And this is the heart. This is the heart of financial statement analysis. Forecasting these economic and business drivers. You know, we're connecting through and back into the accounts. This is what it's about. And this is really and and in business, this is uh, what we're seeking to do understand, understand, so you're still coming to grips with this, understanding the economic and business drivers and then predicting them and predicting them. This is how we run businesses. And up, but here we're valuing them, understand and predict the economic and business drivers of a firm. So that's what, you, so can you feel how you're sort of heading towards that? You're getting into that yeah. process now? Yeah. We might skip the minute paper this time unless you've got something you want to raise, Emily. Oh, no, no, I've got lots percolating oh, got in my brain. Sorry? Pardon? What was oh, that? no, I've I've got lots to, to think about now. So Yeah, we've sort of been discussing that already. Yeah. So what we've looked at is we've looked at the accounting drivers. The accounting drivers, return on net operating assets, which equals profit margin times asset turnover, sales and sales growth net operating assets. These are our key accounting drivers of economic profit and of uh, cash flow. And what we've seen is that we need to, and now we're moving into the economic and business drivers that are driving those accounting drivers, the economic and business realities, and that's what we're going to be forecasting. And so you can see that's that's where we're at at this point now in our unit. Now, next week, we're going to be focusing on the economic and business drivers. So we've been looking at the accounting drivers here, and we're going to be into the economic and business drivers and thinking about what they are for our firms. You can be discussing with other people. And it's and then, so we're going to be looking at that, and that's what we're going to be forecasting for five years. We're going to do five-year forecasts. That's how our model has been set up. But of course, firms like Globe and Ryman Healthcare, their lives are likely to be longer than five years. There's going to be a lot of value beyond that five years. And so we'll also be um, looking at next week, uh, how do we deal with beyond our forecast horizon? Like for Ryman Healthcare, I've made some forecasts for house price, residential house prices for five years and various other factors. But what happens after that, how do I forecast beyond what I can see over the horizon? So I'll be looking at that issue as well next week. And in the tutorials, um, you can see that there's the videos for assignment two, um, is a, is a, and then there's assignments two, step, steps two and three, and weekly questions. All right. Um, so Emily, is there anything you'd like to raise or ask or comment on? No, I don't think I have any other questions. I think that's given me a good starting point to go back and have a look 
um, and look over things and yeah, and get my head around those accounting, well, what's driving those accounting drivers and then what's then driving the business and economic. Yeah, so you've got the framework and you have to apply it now to your firm. So you've, you've identified your race, those key accounting drivers, they're in your spreadsheet. And, you, and as you start to think about it, a, a lot of people, I think you'll find yourself just naturally asking why. <laughs> yes. And then you may have to go back into others. Well, then you have, do have to go back into other sources of information, like what might have been said in the annual reports or, or just, you know, in newspaper articles or other things, just generally, you know, you can Google things um, and just get some sort of sense. Um you know, we're, we're learning about financial statement analysis. We're not trying to do the world's greatest analysis per se. So, but it, it, you, can, you can make, you know, just see what sort of sense you get of what might be driving it, get your thoughts. And, and, um, and yes, yeah, so I think you've got the framework to go forward on that, which is the purpose of this lecture. Yeah. That's great. Well, thank you very much. And, um, the, uh, I, and thank you everyone who's watching. The, um, I look forward to continuing to work with you as we get into the heart of financial statement analysis now. As we move, we, we've got the accounting drivers clearly in mind and we're asking ourselves, what is driving it in the real business? And we're starting to get to the heart of financial statement analysis. So thanks very much and, and bye for now. Bye-bye. <laughs>